welcome to the third episode of the Grassroots Football Coach Podcast, brought to you by Barks and Bucks FA. This week, Rivo is joined by FA affiliate tutor Mick Lewin. On the pod, Mick talks about his big influences in the game, his own journey, different structure of courses, as well as managing behaviours, different learner styles, and the important role of the assistant coach. And obviously, finishing off with a bit of Rivo's trivia. So please enjoy the third instalment of the Grassroots Football Coach Pod. See you on the other side. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Box and Bucks Football Coaching Podcast. I'm here with Mick Lewin, one of our affiliate tutors. Um, Mick, if you can just explain a little bit about your past history, where you've um, coached previously and uh, what you're doing currently. Okay. Um, been in and around coaching for probably eight or nine years now. Uh, lots of that spent within um, academies or centre of excellences somehow. So um, done a bit of scouting. I've done lots of coaching. Um, currently completing the UA for a licence, which has been um, quite a journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and for the last season been tutoring for the FA so lots of varied experiences which has led me here with you today yeah. OK um, so who were your inspirations then Mick when you first started to get into coaching? Do you mean in terms of like tutors or yeah, maybe past in tu- the professional game? or Tutors, professional game um, coaches that you may have played under um, one of the biggest influences I remember um, I don't know if you know him actually Keith Styles, who was yeah, uh, my tutor for my level two, think back in 2007, I did it at a Thatcham Town Football Club. Yeah. And he was excellent. I remember um, loving how he delivered the course, uh, his principles, very simple. Um, and obviously he was working with Fulham. He helped me get a position in Fulham's community scheme and stuff okay. like that. So it was, uh, he was one of the first big influences. And um, whilst I wouldn't want him to know really uh, I suppose my recent work with Jeff Noonan has been quite um, important for me and my development. Uh, we've got on very well in terms of understanding the game in a similar way, bounced ideas and stuff like that. So in terms of my own journey, probably those two uh, stick out as biggest coaching influences. OK, that's brilliant. And you now as a um, affiliate tutor with Box and Bucks, yeah. what would you say some of the main differences are in terms of Um, the courses and how they're structured now um, in comparison to when you were a candidate on those courses? I think they're literally chalk and cheese. I think the FA have done a fantastic job in modernising the courses. Um, I think I did my level one in 2005. The level two was similar where there was a a list of practices. Uh, The tutors would deliver a few. You'd pick them out of a hat and you've got to deliver one exactly that way sort of thing um, and you could pass my level three I didn't particularly enjoy actually when I did the course I remember having a bit of an argument with the tutor because I had defending in in wide areas yeah and uh, with the players I had I wanted to show the wide man inside mm. I was happy that if he had a shot from there a I could live with it if he scores B our keeper was really good yeah. I didn't want him going down the outside, but he said, if you show him inside, you fail. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and so, yeah, it was one of those, I guess, the driving test scenario pre- previously. You want to do it this yeah. way and you'll pass, yeah. and then you can go and do it the other way. I, I much prefer how it is now where we're trying to inspire coaches to do it their own way. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you as well because now it, it's sort of philosophy dependent isn't it so that example that you alluded to then about inside or outside you know I, I've sort of played in teams and coach teams where certainly in that defensive third we want to show the wide players outside and be yeah. able to deal deal with any crosses that come in And um, but if you don't have the players to be able to deal with that exactly then yeah. you've got yeah. to play to your strengths yeah. is, is, my, is my opinion on it anyway but, and, and on that scenario um, I was speaking to a, a, a goalkeeping coach and I was saying you know does anyone actually ask their goalkeepers in that situation? What you, you know, prefer? Yeah. Do you, are you a goalkeeper that's happy um, uh, stopping or potentially stopping shots? Yeah. You know, and comfortable with that? Um, or are you someone that's happier, you know, catching balls from, from crosses? Yeah. So, I mean, the teams that I've been involved in, certainly coaching, I've, I've, I've 
wouldn't have thought of asking the goalkeeper what they preferred. But um, no, correct. no, I wouldn't have either. I don't yeah. think. But I mean, even like watching that um, Man City Liverpool game last night. So Carius clearly doesn't like crosses. Mm. So if you're the Liverpool manager, you want to stop crosses mm. because he can't. He doesn't want to deal with them. Yeah. So I, I don't think you can have a blanket rule. You've got mm. to play play to your strengths. Mm. Mm. OK, um, so what would you say, you know, and I spoke about it just then about coaches now having to have a, a coaching philosophy. You know, mm -hmm. us at England, we've got a coaching and playing philosophy, our, our yeah. DNA, which yeah. you'll be familiar with. And yeah. a lot of the candidates on the courses now certainly will be also. Yeah. Um, what would you say your coaching philosophy is? First of all, I struggle with the word philosophy. I think it makes it sound a lot cleverer than it actually <laughs> is. Um, but in terms of my own, if I was in charge of a team, I'd want my team to be very attacking. I'd want them to, to be pleasing on the eye. I'd want to entertain. I could pick the bones and benefits out of a 5-4 loss, 5-4 uh, win, sorry, more than I could if we'd won 1-0. I'd rather score the five goals okay. and concede the four. Yeah. Then only go through 90 minutes scoring the one, but keeping the clean sheet. That's that's how I would see it. Um, give the players license to change things on the pitch. Make sure we had those creative players. Um, we haven't produced enough Mavericks for a while. Um, yeah, that 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 would be how I'd want to set up. And what about? In terms of a, a coaching philosophy, obviously we've had several chats, and I know that you um, mm. you really like the England DNA, um, you know the coaching fundamentals, etc. Yeah. Um, what sort of things sort of stand out? I think my my you? journey's led me down uh, games based sessions. Um, I've been really impressed with the the layout of the uh, the new level one and delivering it. It's been great for me. The the game related sessions are vitally important so that the players learn the game whilst learning a topic within the game. Mm. Um, linking practice to competition is hugely important as well because it feels like winning and competition has been a bit of a swear word recently and actually we need to understand that that's part of the game. You know, that's what we're working towards. Um, even when we're developing young players, it's not the most important thing, but I'd still want to know that those players and the coaches try to win you know, and uh, but are also good at picking the bones out of a loss and learning from it and so on. Um, so, game scenarios and and constraints based coaching is probably where I'm at with what I currently do at the moment, and certainly stuff that I try to deliver on the courses as well now. Yeah. So, so, so you're um, a former academy coach as well. Um, so, what mm -hmm. would a, what would a typical session look like? Um, a Mick Lewin session. <laughs> Just because, you know, there's going to be some grassroots coaches listening to this. There's yep. going to be coaches that um, are working in academies. Yeah. But I just want to, want to sort of have a flavour of a typical session that you might deliver. Okay. Like from start to finish, what it yeah. might look like. So always have an arrival activity planned that um, links to the topic that I'm delivering within that session. So um, my most recent experience was that we actually just allowed the players when they turned up to sort themselves into a game, uh, they would know the topic that we'd been working on either that week or during that block, and they would come up with something within the game that mm. set, sorted the uh, the topic. And so they'd that, have complete ownership of it. They'd have complete ownership for the first. You'd probably, if the session started at five o'clock, they would dribs and drabs as they end, as they get there from about half four onwards. Yeah. But they would know that even into five past, ten past, even quarter past, if it was going very, very well, that we would allow them to um, have complete and utter ownership over the session um, at that point in terms of the arrival activity. Um, I try to use as little equipment as possible so that it's nice and easy to flip between bits and bobs. Mm. So... Um, my, a typical session probably is a pitch marked out with two, with a goal at each end. Um, might be divided into thirds, into channels, have into halves or whatever with spots, but it's probably a pitch. It probably requires two teams bibbed up. Um, so after they've done their arrival activity, it's very easy to continue then through where keep your bibs on for the session. You don't have to worry about that. So it's quite 
fast moving. Um, I've been called punchy recently. Oh, I like um, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, quite p- fast moving, fast paced, um, and all within a game, mm. as much as possible within a game. Yeah. Um, sometimes you need to work on individual things and you can pull a few out and you can work with your other coaches on that, but typically it will all be within a game related session. Yeah. No, I like that. And I just um, think back to sort of when I was playing junior football and, you know, when I think back, the sessions were probably so far detached from from the game, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And um, I think I've said it on previous podcasts, but we were almost threatened with the game at the end. Yeah. Um, you know, we had to work hard yeah. and working hard meant sprinting up and down the pitch and... Yeah. Um, doing sort of shuttle runs and uh, the coach used to <laughs> open his boot and uh, produce these big traffic cones yeah. and um, yeah we knew we were in for a tough night then Yeah. but the, um, the the last thing on his mind was us playing a game yeah. so it's refreshing that um, you know we're seeing that now and certainly as the CCD for Box and Bucks yeah. and it's a message that we're um, sort of trying to get out there for all our courses and coming from the skills program also the whole part whole stuff yeah. which which is something that I, I love you know especially from working with those 5 to 11 age groups mm. that you know you can arrive at a session and actually go straight into a game that's actually um, one of the one of the big parts of it really is that letting them try to solve a problem mm. within the part bit in the middle maybe giving them a bit of assistance on solving the problem and then going back to the game and seeing whether it's made any difference. Yeah. But um, sometimes when we're on the courses, we're on courses at the weekend, so that some of the coaches are on their phones because their teams are playing and they're not there. Yeah. And I always think um, the biggest testament is that you don't have to be there for them to do the same things, but they'll only learn that through that games-based approach within training as well. So you almost want to turn up on match day and not have to do a lot. Mm. because you've done all the work previous the prep, yeah. um, and so if you do happen to miss one the kids aren't like oh my god what do we do the coach isn't here they, mm. di- they know it they yeah. know the stuff and if yeah. something turns up that's a little bit different in that game they're still happy to attempt to mm. solve it themselves mm. yeah that's interesting and that's another thing that I'm sort of seeing on the courses really whilst I think the standard of, um, of coaching is on the, on the rise in this country now I'm still yeah. seeing um, a sort of fragment, fragmented approach, really, to training sessions and matches, so they don't sort of marry up. So the teams are playing on a on a Saturday or a Sunday, yeah. and then the training session in the week doesn't quite relate to what's happened on the weekend. I've had um, we've had this terrible weather recently, and actually, bec- as a result, I've had two level ones where the last two days have been jumbled about a little bit because mm. of having to rearrange things. And I've had to do the link in practice to competition and the match day practical all in one day. Okay. It's actually been really good because what we've been allow- what we've been able to do is show the journey between Tuesday, Sunday or Wednesday, Saturday, whatever it is. So if the candidates are putting on a session in the morning, I've almost I've said to them, bear in mind your playing philosophy, what I want to see out of the session that you deliver now should influence the game that we do later. Yeah. So if you're saying out of possession we want to press and you deliver a session now that's out of possession we're going to press, I want to see your players do that in the mm. game later. Mm. And that's been really good because a lot of the candidates have been able to say, oh, we've actually seen the journey. You know, we would go press, press, press on a Sunday. Mm. They don't really do it. And then we'll do shooting on Wednesday. Yeah. And you think to yourself, no, well, no, no, no link at all, no... Um, probably no thought process but bear in mind it's not a criticism because they're all volunteers right. they're all doing a great job and stuff but um if you can just put it within a structure yeah. the, the results you get will be and i don't mean that in terms of winning or losing the game but the results in performance will be far greater mm. yeah and i think a lot of the candidates are quite miffed when i talk to them about you know like the sessions that i have i mean i probably have it's probably not too much of an exaggeration when i say i've probably got about six templates Mm. of sessions that I use and I think the misconception is that you've got to do something completely different at each training session Um, and and some of the coaches that I'm talking to 
perhaps feel a little bit under pressure with that. And also external factors like um, parents watching. Yeah. And you spoke about earlier about not having an awful lot of equipment yeah. out when you do the sessions, and yeah. I quite like that. You know, often I've seen, and I've been guilty in the past of, you know, having a, a pitch that looks like Heathrow Airport with yeah. a different colour cones <laughs> yeah. on there. Yeah. But then to the untrained eye at the side, it might look like, wow, you know, this coach knows what they're on about. And yeah. All these cones yeah. down here, it looks quite whizzy. Less is more. Um, but less is more is one of my yeah. favourite sayings, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, looking more like the real game is, is, is really important to me. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting. But just looking at now... Um, your sort of favourite systems of play, if you like. So, so yeah. again, when you were sort of coaching at academy level, what, what yeah. would be your sort of typical system um, of choice or were you sort of governed by um, the powers above? You're going to get me on a rant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's always been a bit of a puzzle to me, with my background being academy football, why we would have a set system to play because nine times out of 10, it comes from a link to what the first team play. Well, if you're coaching the under 12s, are those 12s ever going to play for that first team manager? No, no, they're not. And in five, six years time, hopefully when they do become first team players, football's probably changed. Yeah. So I would always advocate that you just play the system that suits your players the best. Yeah. If you are in a position where you say, we, um, we, uh, must play 4-5-1, we must play 4-2-3-1, uh, mm. but you happen to have two brilliant centre forwards in your squad, mm. why would you half their playing time to suit a system? Yeah, yeah. Just play your better players in, the, in, in, that, in that system um, or play what suits your players, whatever you've got. If you've got three great centre halves, don't sit one on the bench, play three at the back. Mm. Um, so... I, I wouldn't have a preconceived idea of what my favourite system was. I'd wait to see what I thought su suited the group of players I had in front of me. Mm. No, I must admit, I'm, uh, I'm of that mindset also. Um, there's been, been many sort of teams that I've been involved in or played in that, um, yeah, it's just a, a, a formation that seems to be created on a bit of a whim, really, mm. and there was no real substance and detail no. behind it. Yeah. Um, and subsequently, the, um, the the detail from or lack of detail from the coaches and managers mm. was was then very generic. Yeah. So you, they weren't able to sort of pinpoint um, areas of improvement, etc. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that's interesting. So in terms of um, managing behaviours, right. Okay, hold on one sec. I'm just going to force that there. Okay, so how would you go about managing the difference within the group? So, you know, tutors now will we, we'll speak a lot about um, a variety of different challenges within the mm -hmm. sessions. Um, what sort of things would you have up your sleeve to challenge perhaps the you know the players that are forging ahead or the ones that um, perhaps need a little bit more support? I think the, the method that I use is probably the same method for both. Um, if we relate it back to the sessions that I tend to put on, all very game-related, so everyone's doing something all at the same time. Um, within that, you can set challenges individual challenges for the ones that are forging ahead so if you've if you've got your organization right and they're not being challenged by the organization they're being challenged by improvement then if they've got what you've asked them to you can push them ahead with different individual objectives and so on and so forth in the same way that within the same session if your organization is set and sorted if someone or a group smaller group are struggling with it you can reel it in a little bit as well and maybe mm. simplify it for them. So it wouldn't necessarily be a case where, for me, um, I needed to have something different set. It would be more a case of your observational skills, who's getting it, who's got it and needs pushing, who's struggling with it, and maybe it needs 
explaining or something in a, in a slightly different manner or simplifying mm. it to build on their successes to go that way. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, again, drawing on my own experience, and historically it would have been um, almost sort of treating everyone as, a, as the same um, and not having any different coaching styles, yep. not looking at different interventions, or it might have been... Yeah. You know, I would have stopped the group as a whole to make a point to yeah. one individual. Yeah. Um, whereas now we talk a lot about drive-bys and, you know, do I, do I need to stop? drive is one of the anymore? biggest things that I've taken on board, without a doubt, is um, to, to not have to stop the session mm. and to just know that that individual maybe needs a quick uh, question within the session or a quick challenge in some way so that they, um, they, they understand what it is that you want from them but not giving them the answer. So you're just pushing them that way. So drive-by is definitely uh, one of the biggest coaching interventions that I use now. I don't, I don't tend to do a lot of stop stand still, mm. but not to say that I don't, and not to say that it's not something that you would use because mm. I would. Yeah, I think I think one of the hardest things for me in recent years was the silence mm. and just standing back and observing mm. and feeling that. You know, I wasn't sort of earning my money, if you yeah, like, as a coach, because I'm, I'm not saying anything. Um, I do that on, on the level ones. There's a couple of bits that I deliver where I say, biggest thing that we're going to talk about afterwards is, am I a lazy coach? Mm. Do you think I'm lazy? Mm. Uh, and we'll be able to go through what it is that I'm looking for and what I want to get out of it and my outcomes as a result. Um, rather than, again, the sort of all singing, all dancing. He must be good. Look how many cones he's used. And there's yeah. a blue box over there and there's a yellow channel down there and all that sort of mm. stuff. And actually, some of it is, have we, uh, have we taken away from just purely good observational skills, mm. you know, understanding what you're looking for? Mm. Yeah, and catering for the different learners within the mm. group, you know. Mm. I, I, I'm still, to this day, not sure what I'd class myself as in terms of, you know, my learning um, capacity, whether it is... <laughs> Uh, visual. I'm pretty kinesthetic, so yeah. you know I like to be sort of on the move and perhaps involved in practical demonstrations. But yeah, um, yeah I certainly try and cater for for most individuals within yeah. the group. And again, going back when I was growing up, it would have been everything would have been done in an auditory fashion. So yeah. you know, I'd find myself hiding behind you know the rest of the group or, or going towards the back of the group to try and watch to try and yeah gained an understanding of what the coach wanted yeah. because I would have been um, too sort of threatened, if you like, to ask the coach a question in front of the rest of the group. And I think actually there's, it's funny you mentioned that because there's a, it's that, that sort of thing has flipped on its head now as well. Mm. Because coaches are good at questioning, yeah. kids have become good at answering questions yeah. rather than actually knowing what you want from them. So they can they, just tell you what you want to hear. Yeah, yeah pressing. Uh, or whatever, and they they can use the bud, buzzwords yeah. and answer questions, whether or not they actually understand what they're saying, mm. and whether they can put that in practice. And that's where you do need to cater a little bit because it's almost like the, okay, you you have heard and you've told me what I wanted to hear, but can you show me? Yeah, that sort of thing. So actually, you you're sort of catering to rather than saying I'm going to speak to that player like that because this is the best way that they understand. It's almost like what's the best way for them to demonstrate to you that they understand? Mm, mm. Which probably goes back to sort of knowing the individuals within the group, yeah. etc. But um, I think equally, uh, sometimes I see it going the other way as well, where, where I'm seeing coaches naturally, or try and let the game evolve naturally by sort of standing at the side and yeah. almost becoming a facilitator or <laughs> becoming a referee for that part of the, yeah. the, the practice when... You know, clearly, you know, there's, there's a there's a breakdown and the, the, the session is not evolving how, how they'd want it to. But yeah. they're just thinking, well, you know, I promised them a game at the end, so I'm just going to sort of stay out of the we'll way. But, yeah, and I think I think equally that, you know, that, that there is times where we need to step in also. Um, I went to see a coach the other day on a, on a UEFA B um, <coughs> in-situ visit, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic, and he had... You know, I counted at the end and I actually timed the interventions, but there was 10 individual interventions and 10 group interventions okay. within about an hour and 15 minutes, I think I was there. You know, I don't know whether that sounds excessive or not, but the, the, certainly the individual interventions might have been, I think the longest was 
five seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are little drive-bys. The shortest was about two seconds. Yeah. So just little reminders, little cues, little prompts, those sort of things. So Again, that's knowing your players, isn't it? Because some of them will need a little bit more. Some of them, you're, you're looking at it and you're going, I know that they don't understand this. Mm. And actually, I don't want to stop the whole group. So it might be that you pull that player aside for a bit. And that might last 30 seconds, but the, the, the session's still going. Mm. So it's not you're not stopping everyone playing. Um, equally, someone does just literally need... A, sometimes you can say with like a dribble or pass... You know, that yeah. sort of thing. And they would just look at you and go, dribble, yeah. or whatever it was that they needed at the time sort of thing. But you're still involving that individual in the process. Yeah. Um, whereas before it would have been, you know, you're, you're telling me exactly what to do. Yeah, so, pass it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I have seen that before also where it's very much, sessions have been very much coach-led and the player's been mm. almost looking around for the coach to tell them sometimes, the next movement. Sometimes I would say... As we all do, sometimes people do just need telling. Correct, yeah. Um, and so while we talk about how coaching in the country has evolved and so mm. on, everything's a balance. And so I don't, I don't think that there's a particular right or wrong way. The, the chances are if you use a variety of different ways to do things, that's probably about as close you can get to saying it's correct. Mm. Um, rather than saying, oh, it should be this, it should be that. Actually, probably, if you delve into it deeply enough, it's probably a bit of both that mm. will sort it out. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, certainly delivering on these sort of UEFA B courses now, we're starting to look at um, the setup of teams, we're looking at units, we're looking at individuals within units, we're yep. looking at units within units. <laughs> yep. um, so in terms of your sort of challenges, you know, are there times where you might have to just work with a particular unit? Um, and if you can just give us a flavour of some of the things that you might sort do of do mean, and say to them. Do you mean in terms of like a in the week leading up to a game sort of thing? Or? Yeah, it might be that. It might be on a match day. Um, but are there certain things where, you know, you can just take the unit out of that session? Now, it might be the, the, the two strikers that you, you yeah. sort of whip out of the session and just give them some prompts and challenges. So it think, might be um, something to do with the back four. Um, and it might be as simply, I'll give you an example of... Um, one of the teams that I coached recently, and it might be the environment of a, of a changing room where we actually got them to sit in their units, yeah. um, which in terms of, you know, that message that you're delivering and trying to get across yeah. was made so much easier when you've got the defenders in one area, the goalkeeper with the goalkeeper, midfielders in one area, yeah. strikers in one area, yeah. and you're not having to sort of look around for five seconds to try to find certain individuals. I think initially to answer the question, I would say that um, w within, again, sound broken record, but within a game related session and what you alluded to as well, of only really having sort of say six, seven practices that you, mm. you set up, it, essentially every practice you can work with either the team in possession or the team out of possession. So if it was a specific, I want to work with the, the back four, the back three, the defenders, whatever, whatever it is, I would choose to do that within within the session. The focus, they would know that my focus was them. Mm. Um, when we did stop the practice to talk, I would probably only talk to them and you, I, I'd have probably got my other, the, the assistant coach or whoever I was working with to speak to the other group of players um, about their individual roles. But the, the, the back four, whoever it was, I was the two strikers, whatever it is, you, I would, they would know at the start that I'm, I'm working with you guys tonight. Mm. Um, this is what we're going to try and get out of it. Mm. But then when the discussion came, it'd be very much two-way about that. So making sure that the way that we wanted to set up for it, if it was looking ahead at a specific um, game or if it was just alluding to a particular topic or a way of playing or a new, a new system or something like that, you they they would know and understand that but i would talk to them individually through the session and they mm. would have input on the best way of achieving it mm. yeah that's really good and um 
I suppose the benefits of some of that work as well is you might have someone with you, like an assistant with you yeah. as well, which yeah, is yeah. A, a huge benefit. But, you know, we understand that there's coaches out there. Yeah. So I understand the coaches that might be on their own and those sort of things might prove prove a bit more, um, bit more if, difficult. If, that's, if that was the case, what I would do is say, say I still want to work with my back four mm. and that's what I'm going to do throughout. It might be that at the start when I'm explaining whatever it is that I'm explaining to the to the back four and we're talking about that, that the other players are set, well, you guys have an objective. You set it. You do what, do what you want to do. You can play two up front if you want. You can play a front three. You can go, you can go with whatever you want to go with. I'm going to work with these guys and we're going to try and solve the problems that you yeah. present us. And, I, and that's a really good point. And you'll know from sort of being on your A licence as well. Now, if you've got outcomes, set outcomes that you want to achieve... You know, you need to be tested at some point. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have to match up the opposition or give them a, a purpose, give them a challenge, just to make, if nothing else, just to involve them within the session. When you're lucky enough to have a good relationship with whoever you're coaching with, um, in terms of not worried about spoiling each other's sessions. I used to do it with a coach I worked with at Oxford where on a Friday night we'd call it a battle night. Mm. And one of us would be leading the session and that would mean coaching one team all night on a particular topic and the other one was purely there with the other team to spoil it essentially yeah. um, as best you possibly can so we would we would say I remember the first couple of nights we did it um, the coach wanted a, a particular start um, to it it was like counter attacking I think and the coach um, wanted a way of starting his practice so that his team could counter-attack and I, ne I never let my team st let him start it the way that he wanted to mm -hmm. and he said what are you doing you're spoiling the session it's like they're not going to be able to do that on Sunday mm -hmm. you can't wait for that Correct. opportunity if you're going to counter-attack um, one of the biggest skills of that is recognising when you can counter-attack you can't just set it up now yeah. um, you've got to create the opportunity to set up a counter-attack if that's mm -hmm. what you want to do mm -hmm. And I, after a few weeks, it was really good because we would come up, we'd just put the topic out there. So this is mixed session, he's leading it, he's got that team, he's doing counter-attacking, and the other team would purely go, right, don't think so. And that, yeah. it was brilliant, and that was the way to do it. Yeah, well, that leads me on to our next question, Mick, which is about overcoming problems yeah. um, within a training session. So, you know, that might be, that might be something. But um, what other problems have you sort of encountered over recent years that might be things something at the grassroots level also things mm. like um you know facilities you've planned out a session for 12 players you get nine turn <laughs> up yeah. you know the caretakers running late yeah. um to give you another example the 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 adult team that i coach i planned out and i thought that i catered for every eventuality yeah um, I, I knew what I was going to say. I looked at the team that we were playing against. We had a, a way of playing in possession, out of possession. We looked at positive and negative um, yep. transition. Um, I felt that I had everything sorted out. So kickoff was at two. We arranged to meet at uh, quarter to one. There was lots that we wanted to do. Now, the caretaker did not arrive till quarter past two. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously kickoff was put back but it also meant that I was very you limited no in what yeah. time I had in the in the yeah. in the dressing room. So um that's just one example of, of a recent problem that I encountered. But I think, um, um, have you got anything? The, well the problems aren't exclusive to grassroots like that, that's for sure. Mm. I mean mm. in terms of facilities or equipment or whatever, that's I think that's football full stop. First and foremost, you as a coach you've got to be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Um I'd struggle with the idea that you've planned for 12 and can't adapt that to nine. Mm. Um, I think you, you, you make that happen. What the, I guess the way I really want to answer the question is to say that we're probably, as coaches, we want perfection too much and we assume that perfection happens a lot. It doesn't. And you, you probably just need to be brave with the ones that don't look like they're working. Make sure you've planned it. If you've planned it and it's not working, then you can't blame yourself for that, so that's good. If it's not working and you review it, work out why it didn't work, what, what, what were the problems that needed to yeah. be addressed? Was it you? Was it something that you asked the players to do? Was it the topic? Was it too hard? Was it too easy? All the rest of it. 
and try it again. I think mm. that's um, a really important part. I think we're we're scared of chaos. We're scared of mm. um, the session not looking beautiful. Mm. And actually, they don't need to. No. And football's not like that, is it? No. Um, you know, so, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and, and that's another thing that sort of crops up on the courses as well, that sort of striving for perfection or every mm. session's got to be perfect. Yeah. And, you know, some of the best coaches that I've encountered over, over the years are the ones that sort of look at the step principle, if you like, yeah. and the actually, why is this session breaking down? Yeah. Has it got something to do with the space? Do I need to make the area bigger? Do I make, need to make it smaller? Yeah. Is the task relevant? Mm. What's the equipment looking at? Do I need to add personnel into the session? Do I need to take people out of the session? Yeah. Um, so that's. Uh, I had a conversation really with a coach on a course recently. He said, oh, Mick, I'm coaching, I think he said six or seven year olds. And that they're not getting it, um, not engaged. I said, okay, what do you think's going wrong? So he started to go through a few bits of his session and I said, so who's, you know, who needs to change it? And he said, oh, I've spoken to the players, I've spoken to the parents, I've spoken to other coaches, etc., etc., etc." Everyone the, but... The last person mm. that he thought to question about this was mm. himself. Yeah. And actually, the chances are, you've, you've put it on, haven't you? You've put the session on. Yeah. So if it's not going right, you've probably got to look at yourself and mm. try to analyse what it is that you've not quite yeah. nailed to put it right again and in the future. And that's where the shrimp flies for me that is a shrimp to be able to recognize that yeah why is it not working and now there's something that i need to do to you know try and help eradicate any of those issues we've touched on recently the role of the the tutor in terms of support for coaches though haven't we we've been speaking about it and it is the same principle it's actually when 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 we're there in sessions when we've got our a license tutors with us or whatever it, it's it's a collaboration in lots of ways and actually it should be okay to get things wrong. It should be okay to not deliver, you know, the best session in the world, mm. but to be able to divulge why it's not gone so well and what you're going to do differently is probably the skill of it. Yeah. And if you've got a, a mentor or a tutor next to you, why, why wouldn't you use them as much as physically possible to, if that's mm. someone with more experience than you, brilliant, come on, let's have a chat. Why, why do you think it's not going so well? Yeah. And like I said to you on our journey here today, I think um, that's something, or that certainly that's an area that um, I think I've changed in over over essentially the last five years or so. I think I may have been one of those coaches that would have felt a little bit threatened by someone observing my session or or critiquing my session or giving me some sort of feedback at the end whereas now I'm really really open to it and I had someone observe my session the other day um, and just gave me I think three points at the end mm. and I was like well I didn't you know I was obviously it was my session I was involved in the session yeah. but I didn't realize um, and it was three sort of basic things that can only um, you know aid my pro my, my progress um, but I really welcome that mm. feedback definitely Definitely. Um, okay, so the last question on this section is just about how football's evolved and, um, you know, playing and coaching. Mm -hmm. And how do you think it's evolved over, over the years? Um, certainly from my own point of view, um, and now working within the FA, the courses are much better. Uh, coaching as a whole, how we go about coaching, that's evolved greatly and it's much, much better. Still an evolving process, but the the corners that we've turned in terms of how that comes about and how we can make better coaches I think is far better and I've certainly benefit, benefited from it from my own personal point of view and I'm enjoying delivering courses mm. like that as well as a tutor So if you had to be specific and sort of drill down what sort of areas do you think I think um, we have to allow we have to be allowed to empower coaches to do things the way that they want to do them as long as there's thought gone gone into it. Uh, back to the the B license thing for me, why is it wrong to show inside? Mm. You know, Pep Guardiola plays his fullbacks in centre midfield mm. for a while. Does that would he would he have failed his B license in 2010 <laughs> doing that? Do you know what I mean? It's um, it's that sort of thing. So I think we have to empower the coaches. The coaches can't be little robots. We need 
because that's where innovation comes from. That's where we get new ideas because you think, so, blimey, that was good. Yeah. You know, and that's how we have to problem solve as coaches. In terms of where football's gone, um, I think we have too much of a focus on how, is there, is there a right and a wrong way of playing? I think everyone has looked at those Spain teams and the Guardiola era and thinks that that's what football should look like. Mm where I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that football looks like the best possible version of what you've got to work with. Um, and we can't all... I'd, I'd, I'd use the analogy that I think Sean Dyche this year, for example, does a fantastic job with Burnley. Mm. You'd back that he can work with better players. Could Guardiola go to Burnley and make them play like Barcelona? Mm. I don't know. It'd be, be interesting to see him try. Yeah, and I think and I think there's a misconception with exactly what you said about you know the Barcelona way and the Real Madrid way and the Bayern Munich way and the, and again I think we're getting to a stage now with the FA where where people are sort of standing up and taking note of what we're doing. Mm. I know at a recent meeting um, at St George's we were told that you know there are sort of organisations now that are making appointments to come to St George's to have a look at what, do, what we're doing um, in light of recent successes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just going back to the point on, you know, the Barcelonas and things, that's something that I'm seeing also is it just seems that every team that I sort of go and observe or watch nowadays wants to play out from the back. Yeah. They all play out from the back. But, the big, you know, and that's fine, but the biggest question certainly now as, as, as tutors is that question of why yeah you know and if it's and if it relates to their philosophy and it's if it's something that they're, they're working on and if it's something that benefits the players within the system then that's the key great. bit your Look, last point fine. there is the key bit yeah. does it benefit your players mm. or actually I mean I cut in every experience of academy football I, I don't know a team a club in the country that's philosophy doesn't sound very, very similar yeah. in terms of we're going to play through the thirds, we're going to play out from the back. Mm -hmm. You might have tweaks on what certain clubs allow to happen and what the definition of playing out from the back. Does the goalkeeper go into the striker? Is that is that playing out from the back? Um, but if we, if we do that, we're only producing one type of football, one type of player. Mm. What about... Could... Alan Shearer, a great English striker, could he play in a 4-3-3 or does he need a partner in a 4-4-2? Mm. Does he need wide players getting it in the box? This was a player that has come through our ranks who was top draw, mm. world, um, world record transfer fee at one point. Are we ever going to produce another one of him? Mm. Don't know. Yeah. No, it's interesting. It's something that we could probably talk about <laughs> for, for, for a bit longer, actually, um, you know, philosophies and things. But, yeah, I think it certainly depends on, on the players that you've got at your disposal. Um, and some of the best coaches I've seen work have a variety of different ways of <coughs> playing. They look at different scenarios, mm. um, which is something that I like sort of working towards as well when I'm delivering the what-ifs, um, you know, OK, you play out from the back, but do you still play the same way if you're 1-0 um, down in the cup final with five minutes to go? Exactly. And this is my, um, this is my problem with um, an obsession at the moment with a philosophy. Mm. Because surely your philosophy must be a winning philosophy at the, at the top end. Mm. You know, we're not necessarily talking about grassroots. We're not talking about even academy at, at times. There's certainly the younger age groups. But I, um, I struggle with... Man City playing away to Liverpool in January and conceding three goals in 10 minutes and then playing away to Liverpool two months later and conceding three goals in 15 minutes. Mm, mm. How, how can that happen? How mm. can you do the same thing twice? Yeah. Um, was there ever a discussion in between the games of, well, what do we do if Liverpool score one? What do we do if they score another within five minutes? We can't let that go to three. Yeah. And we must have a game plan. Whereas I think when you have that philosophy where there's just a um, almost like a, a stubborn concentration on what we do when we get it right, we'll win. Well, what about when it's going wrong? Yeah. Yeah. And these are the things that we're trying to enforce now, these what ifs. Mm. What if, what if, what if. Um, 
Okay, so that leads us on to our last part, which is the, the quick fire rounds. Now, originally I said that, um, you know, we could only have one word answers for this, but um, I'll allow you to, to elaborate because it is quite difficult just to sort of say yes or no or just, you know, say, say, say the name. So, okay. um, again, it, originally it was quick fire, but um, to the first one, we've got 10 of these is okay. Guardiola or Mourinho. And can you justify why? Okay, so I want a combination of the two. I want a Pep Mourinho or a Jose Guardiola, um, simply because when he gets it right, I can't argue that Guardiola gets it really right. It looks great. That being said, I'd want him to have that little bit of adaption that I know that um, Mourinho has. Mourinho will concentrate on the opposition and mm. stifle them as well. I don't think the Liverpool scenario would happen to Mourinho, but it happened to Guardiola. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, through the thirds or direct? <laughs> um, through the thirds when it's right to play through the thirds. Mm. Direct when it's right to play direct. <laughs> <laughs> This is another one for me that teams like to play through the thirds, and I get yeah. it. I do get that. Um, I spoke to an academy manager probably <clears throat> two weeks ago now, and they had um, an academy tournament. Yeah. And they were, if you like, the underdogs in the tournament. Nothing was expected of them. Mm. And they played a through the thirds, very attacking style. Um, Centre-backs split to the edge of the 18-yard box, full-backs high. Mm -hmm. um, but for this particular tournament, they said, no, we're just going to flip it around a little bit. We're going to go direct. Yeah. You know, um, number one, it just gives our players a different way of playing and poses a bit of a challenge to them. Now, it's something that they've worked on leading up to the tournament. Yeah. Um, and number two, just acted a bit of a, as a bit of a surprise, really, to the yeah. teams that they were playing against. Now, they actually went on and won the tournament. And they yeah. beat, I think it was Arsenal in the final. Yeah. And he spoke to the... Uh, the, the, the guy that was managing the Arsenal team and he was so surprised he did not expect them to set up like that yeah um, they were very used to playing against teams that played out from the back mm -hmm. and whether they dropped off and let them have it whether they uh, high pressed them I don't know what they didn't expect was that ball over the top of the full backs all the time and they just couldn't Cool. Yeah, and this is, this is where the problem lies for me. And it's a huge talking point because I assume those Arsenal players are some of the best players in the country at their age group or whatever. They, are they adaptable? Mm. Did they problem solve? Mm. Or did they look to the bench and go, well, this wasn't what we were expecting? Mm. And that's the issue. Could the coach recognise it within the game and put it right? Yeah. And that's... I think that's the issue, and that's where we've got this. No, this is what we do, this is how we play. You can get coaches that are fantastic at delivering that, mm. players that are fantastic at playing that, but guess what? It doesn't always happen that way, mm. and we have to be able to deal with stuff that happens ad hoc. Yeah. Um, so we need a set and a variety of different philosophies and different scenarios. No, I agree. Um, so question and answer or command style I think you've sort of answered this earlier on in the interview but um, it's going to be another sit on the fence answer isn't it a uh, little bit of both probably for me personally more Q&A um, but nothing wrong every now and then with a with a mm. command as well sometimes like I say everyone needs to be told and yeah from my coaching perspective more Q&A but every now and then I would use a bit of command okay so constant or random practices so constant practices are those sort of practices that i would have done growing up mm -hmm. um in pairs one ball between two the success rates of which are quite high yep um you're over a short distance and you're getting lots and lots of success yeah however the decision making with something like that decreases yep um and whereas random obviously touches to the the side of the real game um, yeah. where there's lots of decisions success rate probably dips yeah. um, but obviously it's, it's closer and more realistic to the game yeah from my point of view obviously as a coach uh, much more random practices um, 
it's a question that comes up with level one coaches a lot of the time um, with their grassroots teams. They're saying, oh, you, you want us to get into a game all the time, but some of the players can't kick the ball. There, mm. There's going to be a time and a place for 10 minutes spent working on isolated technique, and that's mm -hmm. fine. But just don't do it the whole time. Mm. But mm. no, from my point of view, definitely random. Yeah. And, there's a, and there's a, as you said then, there's a time and a place for the constant practice. Yeah. Definitely a time and a place for it. But the problem that I have is, you know, if it takes over your whole session, yeah. it's so far detached from the game. So you do that on a, on a Thursday night and then you go and play a game on a Sunday, which is totally <coughs> random. Yeah. And then the players... It doesn't look like football, does it? No. That's the thing. It doesn't look like what you're actually going to have to do mm. on Sunday when whatever way you look at it when it counts mm. as it were yeah. so no for Correct. me random ok Barcelona or Real Madrid Barcelona I probably have to go Barcelona I've been yeah. to Barcelona and watched them play um, my wife and I went out there and uh, yeah I would go Barcelona that being said with the trend thing it's amazing that we still look at Barcelona as this um, amazing team Real Madrid could win three Champions Leagues on the spin. They're mm. the favourites for it now this season. Mm. And, yeah, very, yeah, right. very, very interesting. OK, so this relates to you coaching. Um, so foundation phase or youth development phase? I would go foundation phase. Yeah. I enjoy working with the youngsters. i tell you why as well. It's just that you don't have to convince them to enjoy the session. Yeah. They turn up, they love it. They just want to get involved. Sometimes with a group of under 15s, you can be like, well, I mean, come on, lads. You yeah. know, it's football. Yeah. Anyone in danger of smiling? <laughs> and the imagination of some yeah. of the younger ones yeah, as yeah, well. Exactly. You know, they're so, so creative. Yeah. Um, so now I get that. Uh, striving to keep up or forging ahead. So, you know, we spoke about earlier the sort yep. of different challenges that um, you're faced with. Mm. So... Where are you strongest? Um, who would you prefer working with in that setting? Um, it's great working with players that are forging ahead, obviously. Um, it challenges you more, probably, when you're working with players that are struggling or they've got something that they need to, they need to deal with. All players have probably got both. Um, and so... Which certainly it was one of the things in the academy we went for a season at one point where we had weekly individual objectives for the players okay. so 36 things to consider over a season which for me is just well, nuts yeah. um, even if it's your strongest player in your age group why did you get here are you a good dribbler let's make you a brilliant dribbler mm -hmm. but why are you going to get released that's the other reason mm -hmm. you know what is it why are you going to get released and what are we going to do to try and improve that as well if you got if you worked on those two things with any one player for a season i think i think you're winning mm. um so it'd be the same with the the player at the top of the age group and the player at the bottom of the age group why are you here let's make you really good at what you're already good at but also what you need to improve on and let's still work on that as well okay yeah I actually think on that one that, um, you know, potentially we don't spend enough time on the players that are forging ahead. Mm. You know, we look at the ones that are striving to keep up and think, yeah. well, he or she needs a little bit of work in this area, that area. And the ones that are, are forging ahead, well, they kind of get it to so relieve them. But, yeah. you know, there's still going to be challenges that, um, that, that, uh, that they need and things yeah. that they need to yeah, work yeah. on to try and make them even better, as you said. Um, stop, stand still or drive by? Um, obviously room for both, but for me personally as a coach, more drive by. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pass or dribbler? Probably dribbler. Okay. And Premier League or La Liga? I'll go Premier League. Um, I don't doubt that uh, Barca and Real Madrid, if they came into the Premier League, would um, get into our top four. It's prob they're probably two of the elite teams in the world, but in terms of a competitive league and pure entertainment, Premier League all day long. Brilliant. OK, uh, Mick, and just to conclude then, so what one message would you give any of the coaches that are sort of just getting into um, their journey 
from your experience? Um, if you're looking to make a career out of the game, you must be dogged, you must be determined, you've got to work incredibly hard, you've got to drive somewhere with no petrol, picking up 15 quid and doing the tough things, you've got to, you've got to manage that. Um, in terms of what you deliver, you, for me, you have to be adaptable. Um, it's the biggest message that I'd give anyone. You can't go in just with your tunnel vision of what you think. And that, that would be a message that helps in terms of delivering sessions, what coaching style, what players, um, how do I deal with different players? It, it's it's you. Mm. you, you're the one that's got to adapt. You're in charge and as a result, it's your job to get the best out of whatever it is you're doing. Mm. Brilliant. And with that, Mick, we have concluded the podcast, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, cheers. And that's it, episode three complete. And if you listen to episodes one, two, and three, then you've just banged in a perfect hat trick. Uh, thanks to Mick and Rivo for the brilliant episode. Really appreciate your time. On episode four, we have Saints Ability Coach and England Cerebral Palsy player Martin Sinclair, who will be sharing his experiences on the disability pathway from growing up as a young player to now, and also his and his brother's very unique achievement at the London 2012 Olympic Games. So thanks again for joining us, and don't forget to subscribe to receive the podcast direct to your device. Take care, see you soon.